grandson of right thought. Welcome to the School of Marvelous Light, little flock. Hope y'all are doing well this morning. I know y'all are doing well this morning if you're part of the little flock. Because we got a good shepherd, don't we? A loving shepherd. A kind shepherd. To encompass it all up, I think the scriptures did a good job when it said good. Because <laughs> anything that's good, that's what our shepherd is. See? Today, I want to talk about a nuance of being on this side of things. Nuance is one of those words that has an interesting meaning. You know, a nuance is like if you, if I take a jump shot, it looks one way. And if my brother or you take a jump shot, we're both taking jump shots, but it's nuanced differently, which means you take it a little differently than I do. But when you come into the new world, there are certain things that are drastically different, and then certain things that are just nuanced. They're just a little bit different. Hard to actually notice. You see? And one of those things is hard to notice at first is the transition of the preacher, I mean, of the preaching, the transitioning that it causes within another. So if there's being some preaching being done, then there's a preacher. One of the dilemmas he faces is once he starts to preach, then those who are hearing him go through a transformation. And one of the steps of that transformation is actually his anger, his wrath. And it's really his fear is exposed, is honestly what it is. Because perfect love casts out fear. So the preacher is perfect love, you see. The truth is perfect love. So the preacher is teaching the truth. But in the midst of that receiving of the truth, the receiver has his fears uprooted. You see? Pulled out by the root. Because perfect love is what puts it out. But that love may not be received as love when that root is being pulled. You see this here? When the root is being yanked on, that garden may not understand that yet. It may not perceive it as love. So it lashes out in fear. And that's the, the fear being exposed, you see, or the root being exposed. In order for you to get the plant out, you have to dig it by the root. So the preacher is talking to you and talking to things that are deeply rooted in you. Those are the things that's difficult to overcome. Some weeds, they're not deeply rooted, so they come up easy. A strong breeze may even blow him off the ground. Root and all, you see? But then there are other ones that are deeply rooted. You see that there? They've been there for a long time. Their roots are all intertwined in with other things. You see there? And that's why Abba said, when you uproot the tares, wait a while because I don't want to uproot my wheat by the roots being tangled together. I have to detangle the roots. Then I'm going to pull it out. Hope y'all can hear this today, little flock, and grasp what your father's telling you today. Do you hear that? He has to detangle the root system first. That's called the dividing the wheat in the tares, which is what's happening in the lives of the elect. Their roots are being detangled from the tares that have been around them so that they don't be uprooted when he uproots the tares. And so do you see how the grandson has been telling you all this time? Hey, brothers and sisters, if what you've been doing is not true, then it will be taken out of your life. Do you see what I mean now? Because the, root, the, the, the roots of the tares and the wheats have intermingled, and the, the tares have intermingled with the wheat, which means you believe some of them are your sisters, brothers, children, daughters, sons, wife. But that's not actually true. <laughs> wheat and tares aren't actually the same thing at all. They're two totally different manner of people. You see there? 
so if he takes those things out of your life before you're ready, then, in other words, before your roots are separated, then you would be uprooted, just like he said you would. Do you see how that goes now? You'll be pulled up when he pulls that child or that woman or that job or that house or that location out of your life. Whatever is not true. When he pulls it out, you see that there? That's how this is going. That's how this is going. So that pulling out process causes pain, just like it does when he pulls that child or that wife or that job or that scenario or situation you were in that you thought was good for you and healthful. And you found out that it actually wasn't, just like a tear. You thought it was a wheat, but then you cracked it open and found out that it wasn't, so you discarded it. Same thing like Ishmael with Abraham. See how it caused him distress? Abba never told him to do that, did he? Did he, did he tell Abraham to go have Ishmael with Hagar? Did Abba tell him that? Or did he tell him, your wife Sarah is going to have a child? Which one? See what I mean? Now, when Abraham didn't do according to the script, he suffered distress. So are you better than Abraham? Or are you children of Abraham? Or if you're children of Abraham, then you're going to suffer in like fashion that Abraham did. You're going to be distressed the same way because you went along with your life because you lack faith. You got married when you thought it was a good time to get married. That's a lack of faith. That's fear. You see? You got you bought that house in that location and got a 30-year mortgage because you thought that was a good plan. It wasn't Abba's plan. He had a plan that you'd be free to move about and go here and go there and do this and do this because he got you on a mission. But you didn't know you even know you was on a mission. You didn't even know you were his. You see how that's going today? You see how that's going? And so once you find out you're his, then you get enlisted. Well, just like the drill sergeant, you see, he was once new. He had to be broke in and everything else, but now he's able to be a drill sergeant to others. Now, how do you think those new privates are going to feel, or those new soldiers, those new recruits, excuse me, are going to feel about their drill sergeant when they first meet him? How do you think they feel about it when they first meet him? They think he's an asshole. They think he's a jerk. They think he's doing too much. They think he's tripping. They think he's going too far. They think he's too hard. They, whatever they think. They think all of this, you see? They think all of this, and then they come to find out at the end, how do they think about them then? When they finish the course. When they've become who they were becoming. The drill sergeant has actually helped them. They understand the purpose of why he did the things that he did. Now, they didn't at first. They didn't understand at first. They didn't see. But now they do. Well, just like the father. Because the same concept goes all the way through everything. I told you, if it's true on one level, it's true at all. So if it's true about the drill sergeant, then that's true about how the son sees his father when he comes into the world. He's the recruit, and he meets his father. And his father's sort of like a drill sergeant. And he doesn't understand it when he's young. But as he gets older, he understands why his dad blew the trumpet at his bed. Woke him up early. Told him to make his bed. Told him to have his shit folded right there nice and neat. He understands all of those principles now that he's grown. And now that he's practiced it. And now that he's good at it. You see? And he hears those words. I'm proud of you. You're done well. You see how it goes? Same thing when the football player gets recruited to the football team. And he meets his football coach for the first time. Yeah, he cried one time because his football coach made him do extra three or four laps because he fumbled the ball in the game. So his coach made him run some more laps with the ball in his hand and was hitting him with a stick while he was running with the ball, trying to knock the ball out of his hands. And his arms were sore and he cried because his legs were hurting, his lungs were burning because he was running and tired. But then he realized, this is going to make sure that I don't drop the ball in the game, which my coach doesn't want me to, but I don't want to either. I don't want to fail either. I want to do well. And ultimately, this is going to help me do well. So this is actually loving me. How could something that wants to help me do well and is, and is actually doing the thing necessary to make me do well, how is that hating me? If I was a lost cause or to be rejected, then it wouldn't waste this time building me up into something. You understand that there? 
if you got something that needs to be built, it needs to be built, and then you're going to go and you're going to recruit a construction team to build it, you're going to build, you're going to get a team that knows what they're doing so that the job can be done well. You see? Well, those people that know what they're doing, it took experience. In other words, practice. And the best experienced team is usually the one that you go with because they're the most trusted to get the job done well. Well, that means they're the most they're the most tested team. They've been through the most hardships. That's the best team. That's the experienced team, you see? That's what you mean when you say experience. You what you're saying is you've been through these things. You've been through the hiccups that try to block this result. So then you know how to overcome when those hiccups come because of your experiences that you've got. But if you have no experience, you're just on the fly. You're guessing. You don't really know what works. You're just trying to see what works and then learn what works. Y'all see what I'm saying today, little flock? Y'all hear what I'm saying to you? It ain't hard to understand. It's real nice and easy. And like I said, throughout this transition of coming out into the old way and into the new way, this really means coming out of the fearful way into the fearless way. Just like the recruit. He's fearful when he goes in there. He's nervous as hell. He's stripped away from his mommy and his daddy and everything. <laughs> he's all by himself and scared around a bunch of new people. And he shaved his head and changed his clothes, giving him a new, <coughs> excuse me, a new identity, in other words. Correct? See? Just like you. So that truth that you see on all levels of life, on all levels of life, you, you come out of the old, you get a new identity and a new name, just like when you're birthed. The drill sergeant doesn't call you. Say your name is John Paxson. He's not going to call you that. He's probably going to call you Shitpacker. John Shitpacker. That's your new name now until you earn the right to be called by your true name. <laughs> you see what I mean? Look at Peter coming to Yahusha. Your name is Simon, but I'm going to call you Peter. Okay? I know they call you Saul. I'm going to call you Paul now. You see what I mean? Being recruited into the new? Giving a new name? Read about what the scripture says in Revelation about you. If you overcome, you should be given a stone with a new name written on it that only you know. <laughs> and it ain't going to say John Shitpacker neither. <laughs> but you understand the point of what I mean. When you come into your daddy, he going to give you a new name. And he's going to put you through a process of fire to test you and try you to see if you can make it. To see if you're worthy. And if you are, then you get to wear the uniform. And you get to carry the weapon. You see? And you get to march with the army. Now, in the Old Testament, a lot of the titles that you see for the Most High is called what? Adonai Sabaoth. You see that? What does that mean? Lord of Armies. See that there? Read about Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones. There was a nation of people that were depicted as a valley of dry bones because they were considered a dead people. Though they were alive, they were considered dead because they were called black. They were called misnomers and bywords. So that's a dead people that lets another nation tell them who they are, isn't it? A flagless people. Isn't it? Okay, then. Well, see, they were a valley of dry bones. But when they stood on their feet, they stood on their feet in exceedingly great, what are they called? An exceedingly great dance group? Is that what they stood up as? <laughs> An exceedingly great football team? Or does it say army? Well, there you have it then, don't you? So then when you're out there recruiting new troops, some of them are going to cry when you talk to them. Some of them are going to think you're hurting their feelings. See, back to the main point here. The nuance I'm telling you about. The tough skin the drill sergeant has to have. The tough skin the father has to have. And underneath that tough skin, that tough exterior, he has a tender spot for his man. He has a tender spot for his son. He has a tender spot for his family. 
the drill sergeant has a tender spot for you because you're being what he is. You're becoming what he is. And his desire is to make you into that. It's not to see you fail. He doesn't want to, even though he may say that. See how you can't judge outward appearance? But judge a man by his heart, his effort in which he's fighting for you. Got to judge a man by his effort in which he's fighting for you, like David did. David didn't wait for somebody else to fight Goliath. He stepped up when nobody else would. See the difference? When everybody else was running and afraid and scared and knees buckling and everything, he stepped up to defend them. Just like the father does. You see? What do you think anointed by the father means? What did, he, what did it mean when he chose Moses? What did he say? I make you as God, face to face. What did, he, what did he say about Yahusha? <laughs> what did Yahusha say? I and the Father are one. Ask Moses what God's name is. I am. Now take I am and I and the Father are one and try to make it separate as if they were talking about two separate gods. They weren't. They were talking about the same God. It was the people's consciousness that had not risen to the proper level yet. The collective consciousness of the nation had not risen to meet the standard. You see that there? That's why Abba said when the flood of enemy come in, he going to lift up a standard against him. <laughs> because it looks like all hope is lost for that nation. It looks like they're destroyed. Not one will serve Abba. But not so. Just like in the days of Elijah, when Elijah thought he was the only one. Abba said, nope, there's a remnant. So then there's a remnant today. Just like the scriptures say. That went through the fire. That understood that this was an aspect of love. This feeling I feel of, of, of anger is actually a response to being loved when I had not been loved my whole life. That's what made me mad. <laughs> Do you hear it? That's what got me upset is the fact that I've been without love my whole life. So now the fact that I'm really are truly being loved, I'm not able to recognize it at first. I have to learn it. Okay. Don't take it personal as if this means something bad about me because I overslept. Now the drill sergeant is in my ass because I overslept. Now I'm going to act like I'm bad and it's all over. No. Nope. He's only in my ass so that, I re so that I'm reminded to get up on time. So that you don't think Abba has drill sergeants for his army. You don't? So if he does, then how do they talk to you if it's true on every level? They get in your ass. And you scoff when they get in your ass. It's early in the morning. You don't feel like getting up yet. They're getting on your ass because your shoe got a mark on it. It isn't spit shine perfectly. So they're on your ass about that. You woke up late. You didn't make it to chow on time. So they're on your ass about that. Just like the drill sergeant is. Just like the drill sergeant is. And you think that that's bad that he's on your ass. And actually, it's his love for you. It compels him to be on your ass. His desire for you to succeed is what's compelling him to be on your ass. That's his whole purpose, is to make sure you make it. And this is how you make it, by being diligent, by having self-control. When I'm in your face, screaming at you and spit flying out my mouth, hitting you in your face, you're going to control yourself? You're going to have self-control and prove it right now? I'm only testing and see if you got it. I know you're mad at me, but the world going to test you way worse than this. They're going to spit on you like they did Yahusha. Are you prepared to suffer that soldier? Huh? While I'm spitting in his face. You see? Oh, grandson, you're so mean. Look how you're talking to me. The world is mean. I'm not mean. I am kind. I am patient. I am long-suffering, which is I'm proving it right now to you that I am. By demonstrating the truth of you of what the world will do to you. Because that's what Yahusha did for me. He said if they've caught the leader of this house... The father of this house. They call him Beelzebub. Then what will they call you? See? See what I just described to you? Do you see it? How effortlessly it can be done if you just submit yourself to the truth? Because the truth make you free. Free is the best feeling that there is. Tell me it's not. So when you didn't have love in your life, you were bound. And now that you have love, you're free, but you're not used to freedom. You're not used to it. You don't expect it 
to be the way that it is. See, you don't expect love to present itself the way that it does because you're coming out of the world of outward, outward adorning and outward appearance. So you're learning a new way. That's why he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what he said. Transform. To turn from one thing into a whole nother new thing. That's what transform means. <laughs> to take from one meaning to another meaning. What do you say about the heart? That he would give a new heart, a heart of flesh he called it, and give it a new meaning. You see what I'm describing to you here? See, because the old heart is stony. That's the old world, a stony heart. How do we know it's the old world? The Old Testament what were the Ten Commandments written on? Yeah. Heard that little jazzy part on the end I put? That's because we really got some good wisdom here. We really got some good eating. Don't you sing when you eat? Oh, yeah, I know. A lot of people still currently mind they haven't transformed. The little flock is eating right now. We're grazing beside still waters. Okay, I'm leading them to the green pastures that they can eat. Because I, he told me to do that. See how people, they get offended when you say, what do you mean you're leading the flock by the green water? What do you mean to me by the green, green water? Shit. <laughs> Maybe you leading your flock by some damn green water. <laughs> eating green eggs and ham and shit. But we're actually eating grass over here, okay? Heavenly grass. Y'all understand what I'm saying to you? You get it? They say, oh, what are you trying to say? You're the good shepherd? Well, let's see what Yahushua said. The hell with what you said. You ain't got shit worth hearing. Let's hear what Yahushua said, because Abba, Abba said, listen to him. And what did he say? He said, if you love me, <sighs> that's what he said first. I'm going to let it marinate on your brain to see if you can understand what I'm about to say before I knock your noggin loose. If you love me, then you will be doing what? Well, what did he say you'll do if you love me? While you're thinking, I'm going to go ahead and put some onions on this meal and some green pepper. I'm going to cut it up in there, too. So it smells real nice and good as it's sautéing. I'm waiting. If you love me, and he said it three times, so there's no reason you shouldn't know what comes next because he said it three times in a row. And what was it? If you love me, feed my lambs. If you love me, feed my sheep. Do you love me? You know I love you. Well, then feed my lambs and feed my sheep. That's what you do. So then you see why I'm saying what I'm saying to you then? We're eating. <laughs> that's why I'm singing skiddly dee, because that's what you do when you're eating. When you was a kid and you was hungry and your mama finally said, OK, it's time to eat. And you ran in the kitchen and grabbed your plate. You were skipping and dancing in there. Don't act like you weren't. Become a child again, Yahushua said. So skip and dance when you eat, when you got the peanut butter and jelly all around your mouth. Because you're messy when you eat it because you're a child again. You don't care what people think about your face being all messed up like that. That means it's good. What did you think I meant with this dirty face? That it was gross? If it was gross, my face would be clean. Don't you want me to think your sandwich is tasty? I'm proving that it was by having it all over my face like this that's got you so offended because you judge outward appearance. Dummy. <laughs> <laughs> At least the Japanese understand that when you eat a bowl of soup and some noodles, you slurp that shit to show the patron how good it tastes. I mean, not the patron, but the one who made it. You show them how good it tastes by slurping it. That proof is good. I don't have to tell you it's good when I do that, do I? No, you don't. Yeah, but everybody's so offended by 3D things because they're of the 3D world. So if they're of the 3D world and they're coming into the new world, then they're going to get their hearts smacked on and beat up like that drill sergeant going to do that new recruit they all they also do hazing brotherhoods do what's called hazing right why do they do that don't uh tribes of the earth have what's called uh, uh rites of passage from boyhood into manhood they go through rites of passage why do they do that why did why do humanity have things like this these rites of passage why do they do that Because if it's true on one level, it's true on all. That's why. So Abba tries his in a furnace of adversity to test you, to see. And so any CEO 
that's going to have somebody take over for them or any business owner that's going to have somebody take over the business for them, they'll put them through little tests to test them to see what kind of mind they have, what kind of integrity they have, what kind of characteristics that they bear. They're going to test them to see if they're worthy to take over that position. They don't just say, here you go, it's yours. Dude, you spent 49 years building that company and now you're going to give it to somebody that has no experience and never ran anything in their life, never know what to do, never knew what to do. You're going to give it to them? Yeah, it's all good. They don't need any training. They know what the hell they're doing. They actually don't know anything about what they're doing. So what do you mean? It's not wise to do that. See how that goes? A man will have a business and everybody expects it to pa expects him to pass it down to his son, but he knows his son is a screw up, so he doesn't give it to him. He gives it to one of his trusted advisors. And the family may be mad about that. The son himself may even be mad about it. They can piss and moan and get mad and get, and get glad and do whatever the hell. <laughs> like my mama, my mama would tell me when I was a kid, you better scratch your ass and get glad. <laughs> I'd be moaning about something. Oh, man, dang. Hey, 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 you better scratch your ass and get glad. <laughs> so my mama used to tell me that. You used to scratch your ass and get glad, man. All this sitting around moaning and complaining ain't going to change the decision that was made. You see there? That's the point my mama was saying. I said no. You're sad because I said no as if that sadness is going to change my decision. I said no. So you better scratch your ass and go on and get glad. <laughs> Y'all see that today? And that's what you have to tell people that are coming into the truth. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm well seasoned. That's why I'm a drill sergeant here. I'm not saying that's my position. I'm saying that's what the drill sergeant says. I already know how this goes. That's why I was picked to be this guy. <laughs> Now, these new guys don't know how it goes yet. They don't know. So they're going to be shocked. And that's part of it is for me to run in the room where they're at. They've never seen me yet. Me as the drill sergeant, they're going to open that door. I'm going to run in their full speed. I mean, literally run in their full speed with the other sergeants. We're going to run at these new recruits. We're going to scream in their faces. We're going to scare the bejesus out of them. We're going to scare the daylights out of these guys. So then if it's true there, it's true everywhere. Just like the cub that's born doesn't just walk right up to his father lion the day he's born. It takes time and a process before he's presented to that male lion. And he's very skeptical and shit as he's walking toward that male lion, hoping the male lion doesn't kill him. He's terrified. Do you understand how it's always the same? What did the children of Israel say when they came to the mountain to, to talk to Abba, their father? It quaked and they got scared and terrified and said, hide us. <laughs> see, Moses, you go talk to him. We're scared as hell. You see? So then if it's true there, then you damn sure know it's true everywhere. And it is true there that that's the way you are when you meet your father. You don't think your father loves you because you're not computing his chastening rod as love. Even though Abba in his word says that's exactly what it is. He who the father loved, he chastened often. So imagine you have a father and he's very tender and soft with you, which is a good thing, but he's always tender and soft with you. He's unbalanced. You see, he's never firm. You see there, he never keeps you. He just tends to you. You understand? So then you grew up with this imbalance. And then you, when you see, when you grow up and Abba reveals that to you, Hey, you lacked something, so it's time to go to the drill sergeant, and then he puts you there. You're shocked because you're like, my dad never did this. He never talked to me harsh like that. He never snatched me out of my bed and threw things at me and called me these terrible names like maggot and all this. He never did, did me like that. Yes, that's because you were spoiled, the scripture said. You were spared the rod. You see? The, the shepherd has a rod and a staff. The staff is to protect, to tend to the sheep. The rod is to correct and to protect. So when you spare the rod, you see there, the sheep have a tendency to go astray. When you haven't bunked him on his head a few times, you just tap him with the rod. Pow, get back in line. Hey, hey, snap, hit him on the arm there. Just tap him. Pow, get back in line. I don't want you going that way. It's dangerous that way. Now, the sheep doesn't know when you tap them that that's what you're saying. See what I'm telling you? 
So he may backbite you. He may bite at the rod. He may try to butt you with his head. That's your brothers and sisters when you tell them the truth. Oh, wow. Wow, Abba. Abba, you are wonderful. The way that you just do the things that you do. <laughs> the way you do the thing you do. However that song go. <laughs> Abba's just wonderful. The way he can just make complicated things simple. You see? How he can make what seems like it's such a difficult thing to understand. He can make it so simplistic to you if you let him. Because he loves you. And so that's, that's an anomaly of the truth. That if you spare the rod, you're spoiling your child, which means you actually do not love your child. It looks that way to the 3D world. You're giving your child 24 karat gold necklace on his first, first birthday and diamond earrings when he first gets his ears pierced. And you're buying him all of this expensive clothes. And, and you're teaching him outward appearance is what's important. And you're sparing the rod of correction that balances him. Like Paul said, I know how to abound and I know how to be abased. Does your son know how to be both? Or does he only know how to abound? Or does he only know how to be abased? He better know how to be both. And that comes with balance. That comes with a staff and a rod. Gives the man the balance that he needs. You understand that today? It's not hard to understand at all. But your son's going to misinterpret it sometimes, which is the point of this message, and it's going to buck back. He's going to say, you don't love me. There's no way that this is love, what you're doing right now. You're telling me that this is love. It can't be. How can it be love? You see that? When it feels like this, because feelings aren't facts, son. <laughs> see? How the dad do you? But when you don't have a dad, you have a, only a mother and an unbalanced mother as that, at that, then feelings are facts. And there's nothing more dangerous than an effeminate man. And I don't mean outward, I mean inward. And so what do I mean by inward, effeminate men? Men that let feelings be their God and their leader. The woman rules their house and it was because they were raised by a woman. Very simple. Why do you think God hates divorce? Do you think God wants his sons being raised by mothers without a father? Or did he say in his word, one of the things he hates is the neglect of the fatherless and the widows. So in order to have a widow and a fatherless, that means the man is not there. So that means God doesn't like that. He doesn't like it so much so that if you see it, then you should pick up the buck, as they say. You should fill in the excess for that woman and that child since she's fatherless. That's what Abba says. What is perfect religion? And undefiled, what is it? So many religious people on the earth, they should be able to say this with the quickness. What is religion? To visit the fatherless, the widows? <laughs> see? You see there? And so, what did Yahushua say about the father energy? He says, Israel didn't kick him out of the house, and the house is left desolate. I would have gathered you, but you won't allow me to. So your house is desolate. There's no man there anymore. You're kicking him out. You're rejecting the father because you think he's mean. You reject the father because you think he's bloody. You reject the father because you think he's violent. You understand? The drill sergeant. See the characteristics? He's mean. He's, he's unrealistic expectations on me. He's pushing me too hard. He's not listening. He's not being understanding. You see all that stuff? Those are all feelings. That's what he wants you to get out of yourself. You're relying on your feelings. He wants you to break that. That's what the drill sergeant wants. That's what Yahushua wants. That's what the father wants. That's what the Lord of Army wants. <laughs> he doesn't want a bunch of soldiers that go off of feelings. He doesn't. That let feelings lead their life. It's not going to do you any good, is it? Because feelings are not facts. But when you deal with people who have let feelings lead their life, then when you start giving them facts, then they just get in their feelings. See? And the preacher knows that. That's why I'm the one telling you guys this message. 
because I've endured it many times. I've had to talk to people who have raged at me, gotten mad at me because of what I've said or what I've exposed about them or their fear. Sometimes I've just straight told them, you're afraid. And they've gotten angry at me and hurled insults at me, yelled at me and called me evil and all kinds of things. Stop talking to me, cut me out of their midst. They've done all of those things, but I was prepared. I knew that's what they would do because I went through it. <laughs> See, it's not uncommon what you're going through. It's just a transition, buddy. And so what does it say about our moment of that? Scripture says that we were yet enemies. Christ loved us when we were yet enemies. So that's what the preacher does. Same thing you'll do when you become the preacher. When you deliver the good news, you see, you'll be the same way. You'll, understand, you'll, you'll be like, they're counting me an enemy, but yet I'm, I'm loving them by telling them the truth. The truth is what makes you free. So if I'll pull out a key to your circumstance and it's the truth, how should you feel? Relieved. But how do you feel? So you see why you shouldn't rely on your feelings? Because they'll lead you astray. Eve will be deceived and lead the house out of the garden. We don't want that. We want to stay in the garden. So we need right thought. We need the husband. We need the father. We need the man back in the house. Now, this wouldn't even make any sense if you guys weren't living in a, in a world that despises the father, that kicks the father out at every chance. Look at the kitty, y'all. <laughs> I ain't gonna mess with you. I ain't gonna bother you. <laughs> but the world spends all their time about talking about child support and kicking men out and making men foot the bill. And as soon as an athlete gets a girl pregnant, you know he's about to pay a bunch of money. And it's like a, it's like a, it's a normal joke to the world. Uh-oh, she about to go run that bag up. Ooh, that's the way y'all look at a new life? A child from father? That's the way you look at him as a money sign? Ooh, man. But that's the world you're living in, you see? That's the way the world working. So they're proving to you that they're pushing the man out of that world. They don't want him because they don't want no drill sergeant. You see? Just like the new recruit doesn't want him, but you need him. He's necessary or else he wouldn't be implemented if he wasn't necessary, but he is necessary. You see that today? So we, as the drill sergeant, understand it and the new recruits should understand it. And they will eventually, even if they don't understand it now. You understand that? So we're going to drop some more messages about how we came to this understanding and what that means for you as the new recruits. You see, if you're being talked to, you're being talked to somebody that was once a new recruit. John, come off that boat. Follow me. Matthew, leave that table. Come follow me. See, they were, they were once new recruits, but they became apostles and they taught others. And, and the church is built on what they taught. You see that there? They became pillars in the church, even though they were once new recruits. So a new recruit is a trusted source of information because he's only going to tell you the truth of his own experience what he went through to become the, the rank he is. You see, that's what Paul said, emulate me. No, not do that to the world. Those emulations are false, but emulate me. Cause if you do that, you're emulating Christ because that's what I'm doing. The leader of the army. So I can be top of rank like him because he said joint air, joint air means the same rank with the pheasant. Can you guys see the pheasant in there? Y'all see the pheasant? <laughs> Y'all be blessed today, little flock. Siloam Israela.